welcome back to the Compressor Guru. Today we are once again on a working vacation in South Carolina. And we're going to be videotaping from the Palmento. What's the Palmento? The Palmento is a DNR ship that goes out to recover things and check on ocean life. <laughs> it's a much sunnier day today, but it's a little cooler. Hard to believe it's going to be Christmas and the weather's looking like this. Welcome back to the Compressor Guru. Today we're here with uh, Captain John and we're going to talk about a boat or a ship. a ship. Now is this a boat or a ship? Uh, we consider it a ship. It is a 110 foot research vessel. So we're an oceanographic research vessel here in the state of South Carolina. Uh, primarily doing offshore live bottom habitat surveys. Uh, research from Cape Hatteras to Cape Canaveral. Uh, ships about 26 foot wide or beams 26. Draft typically about 7 to 8 foot of uh, depth in water. Okay. And we carry about six crew with a full-time chef and nine scientists, so about 15 people maximum. And we'll go offshore for about eight to 10 days. Wow. Yeah. I see why you need a chef. <laughs> That's right. So anyway, start back. Yeah, so uh, you go out for update days at a time and you have research scientists on. What do they research? Yep, so um, typically different kind of research that we do, trap survey research will uh, bring up different species in live bottom habitats, uh, anywhere from 300 feet to 60 feet. So that's our, we call a snapper grouper complex. So your black sea bass, trigger fish, uh, we'll have porgies, we'll have groupers, we'll have snappers. Uh, and what they do is they do a life history workup and then a, um, a tissue workup or a, a, what we call sexing the, the fish. And they'll get a uh, sample, they'll take the odorless, which are the fish's ear bones, and that's how they age the fish. So once they get the odorless sample, they'll take a um, tissue sample and they'll store it. And then we will clean the fish, um, store it, and then it'll be donated at a later date. Um, but so most of that life is donated to who? Don't donate it to who? I don't know who that's oh, okay. is donated to. They have a program that they donate it uh, okay. to some different uh, ministries, but I'm not privy to that. That's not our part. Oh, okay. But uh, mostly we're responsible for taking them out there, putting them on the fish. They do have select numbers that they want us to go and drop, you know, within a couple meters on. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll drop six traps at a time. We'll also do other long line, what we call short bottom long line research, which is a lot deeper water, sometimes 800 feet of water. And we'll pull up snowy groupers, some other deep water species that are rare. Um, but they always love to see those, so it's kind of an interesting, interesting uh, pull for those fish. Cool. Uh, now, we're what three, four hundred miles from the Atlantic, yeah. somewhere in there. So we, this is abnormal for us to say the least. One of the things I love about my job is I get to learn so many new things. And you know, you go into different factories; they're doing this, they're doing that. This is my first being on a big boat. So, yeah. Ship. <laughs> What's the name of the ship? This is the RV Palmetto. So this uh, was built by Collier Shipbuilding in Bayou La Battery, Alabama, in the late '80s. Um, it was originally named the Mr. Jim. Uh, and again, it's a 110-foot supply vessel in the Gulf of Mexico. So we delivered this ship delivered fuel at the time. Uh, can hold about 26,000 gallons of fuel on board. We hold typically about eight, 16, eight in each tank that we can do max. But we don't really hold that full time. Mm -hmm. So. Um, fuel's pretty expensive now, so we try to take that in consideration. Um, but it was an ocean supply vessel, DNR purchased it here at the state of South Carolina, purchased it and turned it into an oceanographic research vessel in the early, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and it was named the RV Palmetto. I've got a little plaque inside, I can show you to kind of explain that. But uh, this lab was put on separately, the A-frames kind of made more into a working platform to allow us to do what we do safely. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we go out, it's calm. Uh, could be glassy calm. Sometimes you go out and it's four to six feet and you still have to be able to work. Obviously we work within limits. We're not out there trying to cowboy. We're, we're not commercial fishermen, but we do work How on the side. How dangerous is it to go out? I, I realize you're, you're a state agency and you, you, you work within parameters and their limits, but just how dangerous is it to go out and well, show? I mean, anytime you go out 
offshore for multiple days, there's a certain level of danger to that. Uh, I would say we're well prepared. A lot of redundancy systems for our purposes. We did have an engine overhaul in uh, mid 90s. Um, I'm sorry, mid 90s. <laughs> 2016. 2016, we had new Volvo, uh, twin Volvo MH16s put in, so we got a lot better fuel efficiency. It's a lot more room down in the engine room as well. Um, uh, how many horsepower is he? 600. 600 twin okay. turbos. So we got 1200 back there. Twin props. Um, uh, so this is dual generators. This isn't the speed D. No, we try, we try about 10 knots. That's yeah. our slow and steady. <laughs> so, but we'll weigh the boat down with some ballast to try to smooth the ride out. But obviously, there's a there's some you know safety factors. If we're in storms or lightning, we secure the decks. Everyone's inside. Yeah. If it's rough outside, we're not working. We try to plan our trips with the wind, with the current, with the tide, with the weather. Mm -hmm. We're never out in rough seas, to be honest. We, we've been out in some six to eight footers, but that's rare. We, so you're not like weather. Forrest Gump no, out man. there getting the shrimp, huh? <laughs> yeah, we're, okay. we're yeah, not commercial big, so. <laughs> I do have to tell you. We, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's always a certain level of safety, but we've we've had a pretty good record. No man overboards, no, no issues like that. We all stay on board and stay safe and make sure we bring everyone home that we bring out. Uh, can we get a tour of the boat? Sure, yep. So right Check. now we're, we're standing on the uh, starboard midships right outside the lab. Uh, we'll go, uh, we'll take you upstairs and then we'll go in the pilot house, kind of show you just around the pilot house and then we'll come down into the galley and bring you through the crews, show you the crew quarters, the captain's quarters briefly, the um, heads, the showers, we got two of those for crew and for scientists. Um, if you want to see the scientific crew quarters, we can show you that down below. Uh, the labs, there's no lab equipment in the lab. We're preparing for our off-season work, and that includes a haul out this year. So a lot of the things that would be in this boat during the spring and summer are not. What's a haul out? Uh, the haul out is just our, kind of our, every three years we'll pull the boat out of the water on either a railway system or a boat lift. <coughs> and we'll have uh, routine maintenance done to propeller shafts, new bottom paint, anti-fouling paint, any kind of hull preservation work that needs to be done. This year we're going to kind of blast the bare metal and paint the whole boat, or not the whole boat, but the majority of the boat. Uh, we'll get all new bottom paint, new sinks, uh, have our shafts props, our shafts tuned, our wheels tuned, reinstalled. Um, we got some electronic work that we'll be doing, putting some new electronics in. That's about it. just routine maintenance. There's always something that needs to be fixed. It's steel, steel ships, so there's a lot of rust. Right. Uh, I got to compliment you. Every time we hit a milestone as far as getting closer to us coming down, I'd get a phone call or get a text. And it would be, are we on schedule, bud? Are you coming? Or is, hey, it's Monday before you should leave. Uh, is everything okay? You obviously live by a calendar and making sure things get done when they're supposed to get done. Yeah, sure. And it sounds like this schedule for pulling the boat out is part of your calendar. It is. And you, you live pretty good by your calendar. I respect that. I like that. Too many people. We both do. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so welcome to the RV Palmetto's pilot house. This is where we kind of run the ship, so to speak, all daily operations. Uh, we do run uh, two shifts. We run at 6 a.m. to noon and a noon to 6. So I'm a mid-watch captain, runs the boat from noon to 6 p.m. and then also again from midnight to 6 a.m. Uh, so whether we're cruising to another location for work or whether we're anchored up, my watch at midnight can be pretty lull, but uh, sometimes pretty exciting. So. But well, this is the wheelhouse, y'all are electronics. We got some things turned on here that run around the clock. A lot of our Furuno kind of works exclusively with Furuno for the boat here. Um, Time Zero is kind of our other software system that we run for navigation. But our main system there shows the weather, what lovely weather we have on its way with this front. <laughs> 70 degrees out this morning, which is rare for us. This time of year, it's kind of nice, but it will drop back into the 40s tonight. So we'll get these days where we'll have 30 degree temperature drops. Uh, we have twin radars, dual zone radars. Um, all our control sticks are here. We've got camera systems around the boat to monitor. So wherever we can't be, we can always see. Um, but this is where all the uh, all the action happens for me most of the time. May I step up there just a little Absolutely. bit? You can walk right on up. So how long have you been doing this? Uh, so I've been doing this since July of 19 I started, but I started working in the maritime industry on boats in 2010. So I kind of came down here and started fishing and working on fishing boats and didn't think you could turn it into a job. And then did commercial fishing, did charter fishing, did tournament sport fishing, and then I uh, had an opportunity to come here and apply as an engineer position 
and uh, started this. It's a little lifetime, kind of a life moment change where you take the the job, the benefits and the job for the longevity. Uh, so, you know, it's not as pressured as commercial fishing. When you go out there commercial fishing, you're catch, you're making what you catch. Right here, we don't have that pressure. Obviously, yeah, we still have some pressure to catch and produce data. Um, <clears throat> the scientific group that we work with has gone on 40 plus years, 45 years or something, like maybe more, but a lot of research. So. Yeah. Now, I see some fishing poles hanging. Is that the, <laughs> There's a few of them. Is that for your spare time? <laughs> uh, sometimes we get the wet a line from here and there, but yeah. yeah, we do do our fair share of recreational fishing um, throughout the trip. And then kind of anything from dolphin or mahi-mahi to wahoo, we'll get the occasional sailfish or blue marlin, uh, white marlins. Uh, but most of what we do is bottom fishing, so it's a you lot fish of fish for dolphins. Uh, mahi mahi dolphins. Oh, <laughs> what's that? Mahi mahi are a uh, pelagic species. It's kind of a, what we call the rat of the ocean. They grow very fast, so once they reach certain size, they'll grow multi six inches in a couple months. But they'll get real large. Mm. Um, it's a white flaky fish. It's just called mahi mahi. Um, Hawaii's name for a lot of them. But we've got them all over the southeast. They start migrating in uh, here usually between March and April. Uh, in, the, in the April, we'll see the bigger bull dolphins that migrate up the Gulf, will come up the Gulf Stream and migrate more. Uh, this is the 01 deck of the RV Palmetto, our smokestack, what we call the doghouse for miscellaneous storage, our trash pumps, extra lines. Um, on the back deck, it's more for storage. When we are in working season, we do have our fire monitor, uh, also our wing station where we'll conduct uh, docking, boat handling exercises. Also, when we're out hauling gear, that's where we're mainly at driving. Even if it's in the rain, we're out here doing that work. So there's a storm coming, but you still have sun. We still have sun. Yeah. We've got so grills too. So. We do have grills. <laughs> they get they get a good loving in the, in the summertime. Okay. No slow. No rush. Okay, where are we? All right. So welcome to this. This we call the vestibule or the salon here in the boat. This is kind of our quiet area. So while the ship's underway. Uh, there's always going to be folks sleeping, whether it's another captain or crew in the bed. It's just kind of the quiet area. Storage, we got little storage bins. Our uh, scientists and crew uh, heads and showers are there, so we do run those. Um, the captain's quarters in the front corner. And this is uh, a lot of storage areas. Again, we're kind of in breakdown mode for the off season, but I'm trying to show you how tight things are. Not a lot of room. Yeah, we keep it pretty cool in here, so it'll be in the 70s while we're running for the most part. When we're offshore, we'll keep the air conditioning down. Mm -hmm. uh, walk-in refrigerator, walk-in freezers over here, so we'll have that stock of food during the season. And then the crew quarters will be right here. This room, due to where it's located at, it's got two supply vents for HVAC, and it's insulated up against the freezer. So inside of this little room where the crew sleeps, it'll get into the mid-40s. So it'll get very cold in there. So it's one of those things where you come out from being in the 90s or the hundreds to having to bundle up to go to bed. So wow. it's, it takes an adjustment. Not everyone can handle it, but it's quite an adjustment to get in there. Usually when we walk in a hotel room, we crank the air conditioning to max. Yeah, cool usually, it down. Yeah, we can usually stand it yeah. down. So coffee pot is always going. That's necessary. Plenty of coffee. Downstairs, kind of tight quarters, but that is where the research uh, quarters are. There's an emergency exit on the other side to come out. But that sleeps nine. Those are just bunks? Those are just bunks. We, don't need, we don't need to yeah, go down there. You've seen there. that. You've seen that. Okay. Uh, watch your step here. This would just be the galley, and this is where all the meals are cooked. So this would be between um, five, well, 5.30 and 6.30 a.m. is breakfast, 11.30. Uh, 11.30 to 12.30 is lunch, and then 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. is dinner. So this is where all our meals are made to feed 12 to 15 people that we have on our trips. Some folks will eat outside. This galley table usually has quite a few people around it. Uh, and any late night snacking that goes on, you know, this is kind of the area. But this mm -hmm. is pretty much the, the bow peak of the boat. It's one of the most roughest riding areas to be in. So a lot of the near folks don't like sitting here, but it makes it cooking a challenge in rough seas. I, I see there's rails around the yep, stove. Yes, around the stove top, custom little brass. Uh, fittings that we've added to keep pots. Uh, we'll have vice grips and things to keep things out of the way. Flat top gets a lot of use and you have to make sure you're not in rough seas there because it'll just run everywhere. Yeah. Scrambled eggs, kind of funny to watch with me and cook them. <laughs> um, TV, um, for entertainment, this is kind of a, a somewhat of a map. It doesn't show the whole Cape Canaveral area, but Cape Hatteras, 
is up here in this area Cape Lookout, Cape Hatteras and then all the way down we're all the way down in Charleston so we're gonna be all the way down here Port Royal Charleston's right here so we'll cover that section and then all the way down the shore, which is even further. Uh, we have our kind of South Atlantic snapper grouper complex poster, if you will. Kind of deals with most of the uh, species that we uh, come in contact with in a lot of our research. Everything from groupers to snappers, triggerfish, spadefish, and your porgies. Uh, and those are kind of just basic depictions of what you would find on a NOAA poster or South Atlantic Fisheries Council stuff. Uh, not all those fish look like that when they come out of the water. And a lot of what we'll do is sometimes we'll keep fish to send to the Coast Guard so they can actually see, hey, this fish may look like that on that poster, but in real life, this is what it looks like. Oh. So each fish has a unique tail structure. They'll have a unique uh, fin count. So a lot of the groupers, you can they may look the same, but if you count their spinal fins, you can tell one's different than the other. Oh, so, so there's like things. human beings. You and I look different. Sure. We have, we have the same amount of bones and yep. other things. Yeah. And each each fish will have some distinctive marks, but not all of them. Some of them are, are pretty uh, pretty close, and that's where our scientists or biologists that identify them, they'll be watching cameras, and they'll, we'll we'll watch some videos of underwater stuff that we have on our on our traps, the survey work that we do. We'll watch this in the mornings or in the evenings to see, hey, when we're in this location and we drop these traps, this is what it looked like. Mm -hmm. So it gives us an idea of what the bottom looks like, what kind of structures so there are. So this TV is not just there. entertainment. Not just entertainment, it's for work too. Okay. Yeah. And I, I assume you don't have a dish. You uh, watch, no dish. watch VCR. It's yeah, it's just uh, pretty much uh, old. We got a little antenna on the on the top of the mast, and it's just regular. Uh, it's not even cable TV. It would be just digital TV, I guess you could call it. Right. But I think I've got a potential. Yeah. So I mean, it just we get a few channels. We don't get a bunch of them. Uh, well, we can turn that off or off to pay yeah. CNN for me <laughs> for going on uh, YouTube. Yeah, I'll see <laughs> so. if we had, I think I've got. I might have a, a sample for you. Let's see. So this would be. Yep. Yeah, okay. So here's some galley videos. Let's see, leg 10, so our last trip, um, let's see, let's see what this one shows. So this will just kind of give you a basic view of uh, leg 10, day one, this was set one. Get used to it. So this is a deep, a deeper trap drop, I believe this is a, a short bottom long line. So this might be in 700 foot of water or 400 foot of water, but this is the kind of structure we're seeing. Yeah, this is super deep. It was early in the morning, so 7 a.m., and you see some of these deeper water species down there, usually a lot more vibrant colors and bigger eyeballs. But there's, I mean, we just happen to drop it right there next to a rock, and the camera shoots at the bottom, and then it'll pick back up here in a few seconds. So that's, you know, anywhere between 400 to 700 foot of water, that's what the bottom looked like in that area. And I assume this is a tethered camera? Yep, so we have a cable winch that will drop this triangle device down that has cameras and these high-powered lights on it. Uh, and then back up this staircase was obviously the pilot house. This is our little workstation here. So while we're on base, we're able to connect into the network here. And we're able to check emails, do paperwork, do procurement. Here's, here's a couple pictures of the boat on the railway system. Hopefully that's no glare there. Yeah. So that's her out of the water. So it's not blue all the way to the bottom. No, nope, we got red bottom paint, the anti fouling paint. Mm -hmm. Protect Fallant, what's Fallant mean? So anti fallant paint would just be for ant it's marine growth. So uh, it's got special chemicals into this paint that help protect the steel. Of the okay. So, uh, that might be the thumbnail for us. Um, so that's it for the galley. We'll head out back out to the engine room and check in. Make sure your wife's doing all right. Watch your step here. Storage, fresh water storage. We take the big jugs. You know, fresh water is a big thing. Kind of one of our limiting factors. We're able to hold enough fresh water for 15 people for about 10 days. So there's no Hollywood showers. You know, right. it's quick Navy type showers. You know, uh -huh. and scrub, rinse, and you're done. It's, yep. Maybe on the last day, when we know how much water we got, you can take what we call a Hollywood shower. But <laughs> for the most part, it's taking it easy. So, here. so we're going down into the engine room. So our air supply and exhaust vents here. That you can see, tight quarters, so it's a little bit hard to get down in here. We'll do our best with yeah, the camera. We're, we're, we're freaked out right now. <laughs> Real tight right here on the corner. So just watch your head. Yeah. 
on drag lines. Alright, so welcome to the generator room. It's kind of one of the powerhouse units here. This holds our all of our uh, hydraulics. So over to your left, my right, hydraulic pumps, hydraulic tanks. Our CHT tanks behind you is our generator panel, as well as our steering pumps and our fresh water uh, pump system. So that includes an expansion tank and a Goulds J10 jet pump to uh, power the water to this ship. So right now we're underwater. We are under the water line where we stand right now on the boat. So to go up two decks to get water that high, it takes a lot of power. So that little pump does it, believe it or not, with an uh, inch and a quarter line, it does its, it does its work. Well, let me ask you. Now, you're limited on your fresh water. Right. After I'll show you the tanks. Here. And we got um, you have 3,600 gallons. You have heads. <clears throat> you have showers. Yep. The heads are salt water. Okay. Yep. And so you send the waste back to the ocean. Yep. Well, no, not necessarily. So if, while we are, we got a new CHT pump, so we're not in any issue with that. We know it's reliable. Our CHT tank holds here, so we'll pump it out daily while offshore so the rule is three miles out once you're three miles out you can dump we don't dump three miles out we dump when we're 50 to 100 miles away. okay we don't do it close to home try to do that um, every night keep it as empty as low level suction as we can okay so, i was wondering about that okay. I, I yeah yeah well people do because i yeah. mean this is a floating office or house if you will so right. uh, behind me is our john deere main generator it's a 60 65 i believe six other than our 40 45s here uh, these just clip 6,000 hours. That's almost 2,000 hours or gross over two. So we're going to be having some extended service work done here soon, shortly. Um, ourselves, our captains, our crew, we do our own preventative maintenance. So that's everything from fuel filters, Raycor fuel filters, inlines, and then also oil changes, which we actually just did last week. So we do all the maintenance. We'll step back away from the technical stuff sometimes to bring in specific professionals. John Deere has professionals with certain software that they have to use on these engines. So that's become a hassle in learning who you can work with and how to work with them to get them to service. But this is this runs majority of the, the boat all the time. We'll run the auxiliary while we're de under departure. And once we get out clear of the channel, we'll shut that down. We'll run off of this for however many hours. And then if we're on anchor at nighttime, this will get shut off at midnight. And when I start my shift, we'll be on the auxiliary. So it's kind of a skeleton crew. There's only two people up at night that time, at midnight, and uh, how many KW are the? Eight? I'd have to double check. Okay, it's this quite a bit. So there's more in this one than that one. Yes, way more in this one. Way more KW in here than this one. I'd have to double check uh, my ratings, and I just had it the other day. I can't remember. That's okay. Um, but yeah, so all Stanford. These were put in, I believe, in the 16, 15, 16, I believe. I don't quote me on that. But generators or fire pump here, right there. It's our, our house batteries. So all our main engine and house batteries are in these boxes underneath some oil absorbents. Uh, we have expansion tanks for your coolant. And then here is the, the generator room, which shows kind of our twin Volvo D16 inch, 600 horsepower twin turbo engines that we have. So this kind of powers the ship. See, I was imagining they'd be bigger. Right, so the engines. old Detroit engines that were in this vessel were all the way out to here. Oh. So this is the, the old brackets for the Detroits that were initially in it were out to here. And these so Volvos don't scream like the Detroits do? Not at do. all. Okay. They're fairly quiet. The turbos can squeal a little, you know, can the noise from that will pick up. But for the most part, these are a lot quieter. They're more fuel efficient. We do have dripless shaft seals. So we don't have that constant salt water drip in the hull. So we have virtually a dry bilge. So other than our using water or dumping it ourselves, this bilge is fairly dry all the time, which is great for the steel hull vessel. And then behind those engines are the quincy compressors that we just had put in at the end of October. Mm -hmm. Now, these are Raycor filters. Why do, you, why do you use Raycor filters? Uh, we use Raycor filters for our first line of defense. So that'll catch, uh, with the micron ratings on those, that'll catch the majority of gunk from our fuel tanks first before it goes into the unit on the spin-on. So it'll be on the outboard. This is the inboard side on the starboard. Those 72-72 uh, fuel filters will catch the remainder. And there's dual, so we have the opportunity, or if one goes bad or we get a low fuel pressure, we can come down here and switch to a second one and not have to worry about changing it out right, right away. But this, the Raycors extend the life of those greatly. Absolutely, greatly, yes. And we change those out quite a bit. Um, 
going into the yard, we'll, we'll have clean tanks so we won't have any gunk in the fuel. But after a few years, you do get the typical diesel fuel right. issues, especially in the maritime environment. Mm -hmm. New impeller and the new uh, mechanical valve. So this, this right here, this system is our flushing pump. So this takes seawater from our sea chest, pumps it to the heads. Uh, this device here is our washdown pump. We're in the process of putting in a, a it's a newer pump. We had to put a new uh, impeller and mechanical seal. So we're going to be redoing that with some better piping. We had it hard piped in. We're going to put a check valve or Y valve in there with the strainer. Uh, we do have a lot of sea debris that will get pulled into the strainers. So you and the crew do a lot of this maintenance we, yourself. You don't farm do. anything out, you can't do it. That's right. All that pipe. This here, which I didn't cover on the top deck, but this is our saltwater ice pump. So we have a saltwater ice flaker. So we pull salt water from the bottom of the ship and it pumps it up, up to the top deck and it makes flaked saltwater ice. Flaked saltwater ice. Right. So real, real thin, so the big drum uh, that just drain, puts salt water around it, this huge drum cools with typical coolant and it chills the salt water like that. So the salt water turns into ice and it's flaked off in this drum by a little squeegee and we have a, a a huge box filler, a little funnel that comes down, fills a cooler. So that's what we'll use to ice all of our fish. Saltwater ice, if you've ever encountered saltwater ice, it is the coldest ice out there. So some of the best preservation techniques for ice, saltwater ice is the way to go. Oh, okay. So that's, that's another unique system. So on the, on the commercial fishing boats, they don't have to haul ice out. They, they, they make They can. They can make it if they want to have a pump. Ours is a Howl saltwater ice flaker, or ice flaker. They're not made for saltwater all the time. They're, usually made for fresh water. Um, we use ours as a saltwater ice flaker, uh, but this pump runs that whole system, uh, and without it, we can't do our job. We can bring fresh water ice on board. We have a small ice maker in the galley, but we can bring fresh water ice on board, but in summer days where it's 100 degrees, it only lasts so long. Right. But for any of our fish storage and preservation, we'll always use saltwater ice. Cool. So, where to next? Where or to do next? we have more back up on the top deck, I mean, so, so this, this, this is where the scientists work. This is where the scientists work here on the RV Palmetto. A lot of equipment that's not in here right now, freezers, uh, computers. It's where they do the life history workup uh, and taking tissue samples, storage, camera work. So it's all gutted for our uh, off-season haul outs and repair. Um, but this is where all the scientists work here inside. And how many scientists do you go to sea with? We'll go to sea with uh, anywhere from six to nine. We can take up to nine. Lately, since COVID, we, we've been taking six. So we take just enough for them to do what they need to do. So six guys aren't in here at one time. No, there's usually two or three in here and a couple out here. They have oh. some overlapping shifts. So they've started working 12 hour shifts on their end. So they'll have a little overlap and there's plenty of room on a 110 foot boat to spread out. Spend a little yeah. time out here, up there in the galley. They there's no real there. alone time though. No, there's no <laughs> real alone time. We, we do, you know, Heads will, will butt occasionally, but everyone gets along on this boat. We make sure to have a great time when we're out there. Cool. We're safe. We, we do it. And as you go out for eight days at a time, it's not like, oh, no, this is three months of this Correct. idiot. Yeah. <laughs> you know? the, true, the true 10 day trips that we've done, those can get a little monotonous. But after about five to seven days, you're kind of ready to come back. Yeah. But it makes for some long, long days, long trips, but that's what we do. And we work very hard from April all the way to end October. Mm -hmm. doing that once our we have what's called a right whale migration when that kicks in here in October we shut down from our research now we still have other groups that we work with um, artificial reef so on the back deck we'll have a sled we'll have big concrete uh, reefs we can take you over and show you the reef yard if you like um, but we'll take out debris and we'll set up unique areas where they need structure for artificial reefs or we'll replace the our reef buoys that are offshore um, state owns those artificial reefs, so we're responsible for putting those buoys out when they get broken or when someone runs them over or if they f the chain breaks and they float away, we're the boat that goes out there to replace those. That's just in our local waters. So John, part of your mission is putting cement in the ocean. Uh, yep, our artificial reef program. Uh, we work with a group of uh, individuals that we take these uh, Form. They make these molds, concrete, these dome structures for artificial reef structure. Uh, anywhere we'll drop, we'll drop off from, in anywhere from 30 to 90 feet. We'll send divers down. They'll make sure that these domes and these structures are upright. Uh, if they're not, they will reposition them using airbags and different techniques. Uh, then we'll just document where they're at. 
We'll get that location, we'll return the following year and document if there's any marine growth or any fish that are located on these um, structures. So there and will be marine growth on there them? There will be marine growth, yeah. Concrete's a good binder for oysters or barnacles for any kind of reef structure. It just binds really well to that. And it gives little homes for smaller creatures to live in until they get large enough where they can move out. Uh, so these structures go really well, our artificial reefs. Uh, these are some monument reef trees, big and small. I mean, it's a little bit of variety in structure that just goes down to the ocean floor. It doesn't damage any live bottom. It's, it's usually just adding more additional structure to the And that's what you use the crane for to load these onto the ship. We and, did. Uh, yep. And then what, you, you set them off the ship with that too? We'll use the crane to load them on and we have a, a very large metal sled or steel sled that we'll load these onto the sled and then we'll lift the sled with the crane when we're on the numbers and they'll slide right into the water. Cool. So, and you make these. these yourselves? We don't, but we have a group here that does make them. Okay. Artificial Reef Organization, they have employees that make these molds. Right, like I've seen videos of people doing these. Yeah, they'll make them. They make them in the shop right behind us here and they pour the concrete, crack them, make the molds and everything. Hmm. And they're very heavy, uh, 2,500 pounds or, and less, I guess, two and a half tons. I'm sorry, hmm. that's more. Under two and a half tons is our limiting capacity. Now, LPH, and it looks like a giant dog bone or a heart at the top. So this would be this would be somebody's um, donation to artificial reef program for the state of South Carolina. That oh. may be a dog or cat's initials. It may be oh, a yeah, family. Oh yeah, it's got a dog and a cat on there. Yeah. Um, behind us. Oh, I didn't even a, notice that. There's yeah. another individual's memorial reef buoy that hasn't gone out yet. Yeah. Um, so we have certain folks that will donate to do those kind of operations in memorial of an individual. Now we've got some for animals. Nice. These guys are pretty creative. They can make anything. We made a shark out of concrete. We've made little raptor, like little dinosaurs. Yeah. Put them down in the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. That'll freak somebody <laughs> out in a hundred years when they run across yep. that. <laughs> yeah, they're diving. But most of it just to add structural or add some more habitat for the fish to live in. Yeah, like our lakes up home, we take Everybody takes their Christmas trees, yeah, and they'll take them out and they'll sure. put them in so they little fish have places to go. And sure, but they disintegrate. Right. These. Yeah. This would be larger scale. Yeah. Uh, now these may get covered up in storms during mm -hmm. seasonal weather with hurricanes. So you may go one year to the coordinates and they're there, and then the next year they're half submerged by sand or mud. But most of this stuff's all offshore. Then it'll be dumped. <coughs> nice. Thank you. You're Captain welcome. John. All right, so my name is Captain John O'Brien. I'm known as JD here on the Palmetto. I'm one of the captains who works Midwatch. Um, moved here to South Carolina from Northern Virginia where I grew up, um, kind of West Virginia, Virginia. Uh, grew up um, freshwater river fishing and never really thought that I could come down and uh, make a living working on the water in South Carolina. So came down here, got into working on boats, uh, did charter fishing, sport fishing. Uh, worked on other commercial vessels and finally got in with the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources as a, a mechanic here on the Palmetto and what a better way to start learning about the engines, the internals of the boat. Uh, when I first got into charter fishing, the guys I worked for said, if you don't know how to fix what you're running, you shouldn't be on it. Uh, and that's cute. When we're hundreds of miles away from home, if we have a problem, we're the ones that have to fix it. We can't call someone out to fly out and fix our problem. So we're self-reliant in that sense. Uh, we have a great crew of guys that run this ship. Um, full-time cook keeps everybody happy and um, what we really do is protect the environment we help we work alongside the commercial fisheries folks and we um, have a lot of statistics that go into our job probably even further than I even know uh, that go into protecting habitats of fisheries we're not out there trying to shut it down and not let you catch it we're just trying to get out there to find uh, what the what the status is of a uh, species of fish so uh, the work we do is long, it's hard, uh, it's exciting, there's always something different which is a great aspect of this job. Uh, being out at sea at nighttime, especially on the midwatch, beautiful, beautiful uh, stars in the sky, shooting stars. The nightlife in the water is amazing. I've um, seen blue marlins swim up to the boat, free swimming at nighttime, it's crazy. Uh, I've seen rocket launches in Cap Can uh, Cape Canaveral, which is pretty wild as well. Um, and we just get the opportunity to see a variety of fish that other folks may not ever get to see. Uh, in their daily lives. Um, just blessed to have a job like this, blessed to be able to work for a great organization and a great company or great or state organization here. 
Uh, and we thank you and uh, the Compressor Guru for coming out and taking a look at these Quincy 325Ls and walking us through. We always learn something new and we have people here and I appreciate your resources and we look forward to seeing you again. So, great place. John, I want to thank you and DNR of South Carolina for allowing us to be here and we really appreciate you. This is wonderful. I learned new stuff. I've uh, never been on a boat like this. Ship. I I confuse ships and boats. Boats get numbers. <laughs> ships have names. Sure. We have numbers too. Okay. Numbers. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. This You're is welcome. the Compressor Guru. Uh, like, subscribe. God bless you. Have a great day.